Hello and welcome back to the channel. It's me, Mark from PowerSonic and Apprentice One to One. You will know I am in a different background. This is one of the booths we are putting together within the academy space to help with some training going forward. And I'm excited to start working in these and demonstrate to you guys some of the stuff we do out on site as electricians. Now, I've always been very careful on this channel to make sure that this isn't a how-to for people who are perhaps gonna be doing DIY at home. So I'm gonna be very careful with this still, but try and offer a little bit more value and insight to those of you who are on training journeys to maybe point you in a few of the right directions um, when you're not maybe getting the experience out on site that you should be, because we all know it happens. And equally, some of the college environments that are out there maybe aren't quite the best either. So it's just to support with some of that. And we're gonna start with metal containment. Now I have shown on the channel before a video of me putting together um, some trunking where I would fabricate the bends myself. And I do realize that usually jobs are specified to use pre-manufactured bends now. They don't like to do any fabricating out on site because it guarantees the IP rating of the containment for one. It's a faster method of putting things up on the wall, supposedly. But I think it's an important skill that learners need to know. It's part of your apprenticeship still, how to fabricate and work with metal containment. So we're gonna demonstrate some of that here. And we're gonna use some of the old school methods. So some of the hand tools that you would have to use on that task, be it a hacksaw and files and simple things like tape measures and marking out your cuts. Um, but we'll get to all of that later on. One of the um, most important aspects of working with metal containment is the PPE, especially when I demonstrate some of the more modern methods of cutting steel containment, using things like angle grinders and jigsaws. And again, we'll get to that in a little while. But PPE, when using power tools and even hand tools, is something that you need to be thinking about at all times during your apprenticeship, you'll often be asked to um, log that in your portfolios. It's a big section of the um, MVQ itself and also on the theory side of your training. And um, you can't emphasize enough the importance of safety. Going home safe at the end of every day with all of your limbs still attached is an absolute must. So don't underestimate it, don't bypass it. As someone who's now in his 40s, I've been there as a young person coming into industry thinking that's all years away, what do I need to worry about that work for? I just want to get on with it, get stuck in, you're fussing over nothing. Let me tell you, knee pads, eye protection, ear protection, you will be glad you wear all of those things when you are an older person and it comes sooner than you can ever imagine, so do take it seriously. With steel containment and moving parts, so with angle grinders especially, you need to think about eye protection. Now I have to wear glasses anyway because I have bad eyesight so I will be putting these glasses on underneath this visor which is um, a polycarbonate shield to help with any dust and debris that comes up off the grinding but also sometimes if you go off and have a little look on social media you will see metal blades explode and end up in face shields and in worst cases in people's body parts. So it's really important that you do protect your face and your eyes. Equally, ear defenders, it's very noisy. If you're using a jigsaw or an angle grinder, there's an element of noise there. So save your hearing. And I don't have any on the desk now, but obviously gloves because steel is sharp, especially when it's first cut. And you don't want to catch yourself unnecessarily while you're working with it. So some gloves that are appropriately rated for cut protection. And I'll demonstrate those when we get to the task a little bit later on. Now, when you're out on site, you may also have to wear other uh, PPE and it's always worth considering the local risk assessment. You may have to wear protection of your head, so a bump cap or a helmet, a high visibility um, jacket. So always keep your eyes out for the health and safety warning signs that should be about your work site and make sure you're complying with those. Follow the risk assessments and method statements. Now, some of the tools you will use in working with steel containment, as I said, we've got the the basics, the hand tools, so this is the hacksaw and you can use that for cutting out quite happily. It's a safe way to go about cutting steel containment if it's tube or trunking. However, it is laborious, it does take more time and um, we've got a, a, a repertoire of power tools now to aid and help us in speeding things up and making our lives easier. Now you're also gonna need your tape measures and your spirit levels, your set squares, pens and pencils, scribes to get marked out. And as we come to work with the containment, we'll do all of those things and I'll demonstrate rather than waving it around now at the start of the video. In terms of your tools, we've got the, the jigsaws with a metal cutting blade. So you can cut your trunking out quite happily with these. It's a safe way of um, working in a more productive fashion, I think. So there's not 
sparks and arcs flying about as you would have with an angle grinder. The moving parts are a bit slower and safer to work with and you get a nice neat finish. So we'll demonstrate this one as well on some trunking. You've got band saws for if you're chopping um, steel conduit. They're really handy to get a nice cut. You can use them on trunking as well, but you need to make sure you mark out and get them square and level. Obviously chop saws with a metal cutting blade as well, that speed things up. When you're joining the containment together, and when we come to do some of our fabricated bends that I'm going to demonstrate, pot riveting tool is really handy. Again, you can get manual variants of this. I've got a battery powered version because I like a Milwaukee power tool, I've got to be honest. And um, fixing your containment together with a riveting system is much faster than messing about with roofing nuts and bolts. And it also gives a nicer finish inside the containment for when you're pulling your wiring in. So I always recommend a pot riveting tool. And then in terms of angle grinders, you can use um, big standard angle grinders to get your cuts. I prefer to use this little cut-off tool, as Milwaukee call it. It's just a smaller bladed angle grinder. I find that it gives a nice, neat finish. The blades are thinner, so you've got less waste material. Because one of the things when you are forming your own bends and your own fittings within containment, you need to try and keep that gap as tiny as possible. And if you go hacking out too much material with an angle grinder blade, you're not left with enough there to make the join good, however neat and tidy you are. So always cut on the waste side and leave the material you need intact for when you form your bend. And we'll get to all of that as we move along. And the last line of defense with all of this is a first aid kit and someone else in the local vicinity who knows how to operate it just in case the worst happens. You need to be safe at all times. And obviously if you're coming along to work with us, we'll have all of those things in place. But if you're practicing, out on site, don't just dive into your garage at home, getting on with all of this stuff. Make sure you've got somebody who is appropriately trained and qualified alongside you, ideally your mentor or an employer, um, before you take it to task yourself. And without further ado, let's dive straight into it. We're going to go and have a look at some steel trunking first. I need to get it up on this board behind me. So we're building out these booths here at our academy and we need to put some steel trunking up around the top and then start forming some tube and tray and other trunking all around me to get this set up in a way that's going to be useful to learners coming in uh, to see the demonstrations and get stuck in themselves. So let's get on with that. Okay, you can see I've got my workbench set up here now. I've got my set square. I've got some bits of wood that I use to put inside this particular size of trunking just to brace it while we're clamping it. Um, this is 75 mil trunking. It's important you know that measurement because all of your markings that you will make are based off of that. Um, you can use a little off cut of the trunk in to make your marks as well. And because this edge is a bit raggedy, I don't know quite what's happened there. Someone's had a, a cut at it and then decided otherwise. I'm not entirely sure why. It's just an off cut piece we've got lying around. And rather than waste it, I'm recycling and reusing um, in this little booth because it's going to serve its purpose absolutely perfectly for what I need. But you can see I've made a mark all the way around here. And that's just so I can cut that nice and neat um, to give us a fresh end over here and we're then going to mark this to just swing up around that single phase distribution board that you would have seen in the booth that's just behind me so we can turn the um, the corner upwards so this is going to form the horizontal base and we're going to swing this up and over because it's going to meet nicely with the other plan in the booth but we'll make our markings and first up is the center marking um, for the the containment itself now you can take a measurement for this off a particular piece of equipment you're working for. So if you're coming back, I don't know, 500 mil, 600 mil, whatever it is, because that's where the join needs to be, you have your measurement. I've actually held it up in the booth and made a little mark on the front here so I can see it. So if I hold that onto here, and you can see it's going to be quite a short little upstand. If we mark that line there, that is now our centre line. Now people use different letters to understand these lines in your textbooks. I think it's CAB, so it goes C-A-B, but I just mark the lines because it's the way I've been doing it. If you want to check um, a step-by-step -step guide of how to do this, there's a fantastic video from Gary when he was at um, Tresham College on his GSH channel um, showing cutting some steel trunking. I think they used 50 mil from memory and he used the textbook and went into it in great detail. I'll pop a link in the description of this video, but I'm just showing you this as I would do it um, out on site. Now, because we know it's 75 mil on the um, trunking size, I go for 75 mil on that centre line. So on your set square, you go 75 mil, and then you mark the zero 
and then if you go over to 150, you mark 150. Now you could use an offcut of trunking to make these measurements, just simply hold it on and then draw around it. And I find sometimes you get a bit of an accuracy with that because you've got to make sure you line it up nicely. It does squish together and move about, especially as the trunking gets a bit bigger. You know, it's not really practical to go holding it on um, and marking it. So I always use a set square. But you do have to be careful because it's very easy to get your um, lines not quite right and end up with a, a poor join. So make sure you're holding your set square nice and tight to the material, that you're marking your lines really clearly. Um, I would normally use a scribe for this, but it doesn't show very well on camera. So you would actually score into the metal itself. That way you've got a, a little line to follow that can't be rubbed off. Um, it is an easier way of doing it. However, uh, with this particular task, it doesn't show very well on camera. So I'm just doing this the old school way with a marker pen and trying not to rub those lines off. Now, these lines on the front side, they just need to be marked for um, the intended purpose of some of the cuts we're going to make, and I'll get to that in a second. We do need to follow the centre line around, so that's going to go down the back of the material as well. And then also over on this edge here. Now it's important this bottom edge doesn't get cut or you will end up with two bits of trunking. But it needs to be marked so you bring your centre line across these two front lips. And it's also a way of just checking that you've kept it square all the way around. Note the cut out there. That again is an old cutout that somebody's popped in this trunking but it is going to work um, in my booth because I need um, a slot as well. So it's gonna come in handy. That's why I'm repurposing. So now we've got our marks, I'm gonna demonstrate the different cutting tools you can use and show the um, difference in the waste material that's removed. As I said, when you're using an angle grinder, it's not something I'd really recommend you use as a learner because it's really easy to go offline and then that's the whole workpiece ruined. It does operate really quickly. If you fall onto the side of the material you need to keep, you know, you've written it off. Whereas with the hand tool, the hacksaw, um, it's a much slower method, but it's um, going to give you a more guaranteed, well, a more likely prospect of not ruining the piece of material you're working with. So it's usually better to start with the, the hand tool. I tend to use a jigsaw mostly because it's fast, but also accurate. Um, but I'll demonstrate it. I'll probably cut the angle grinder into here. So you can see already that's the kind of waste you get with a grinder. Somebody's done that with a grinder, I can tell already. Um, but we'll cut this little bit with a grinder and then we'll maybe use a hacksaw on one of these and then uh, the jigsaw as well. But I'll get this all clamped up now. These workbenches are really handy. If you're in a college environment, you'll probably have a vice that you can go off and use and give you a really rigid point to mount everything to. When you're out on site, you're not always blessed with that luxury. You usually end up with a little work table like this that you've either made yourself or these pop-up ones are amazing. You know, I think this was like 50 odd quid or something from Screwfix many, many years ago now. Um, and it's brilliant. You get these clamps that'll go in the bench. Not a paid advert, it's just something that is really good. Um, and yeah, I'll get this clamped up now and we'll do some cuts. So we pop the material in. Um, I'm going to actually put it over this edge to start with. And I'll move the bench along so you guys can see these blocks clip together and they fit perfectly inside the trunking. So when I squeeze it up, it gives a really solid fixing without squishing it. So that's held nice and tight now. So with the angle grinder, I'll move this along just a touch, trying not to knock the camera over. Um, obviously now, at the minute, the PPE I've got on is just the gloves. So I'm gonna pop those glasses on, pop the face shield on, and um, we'll set to just squaring this off. Um, I'll, I'll stop before I've gone all the way through just to show you. In fact, is what I'll do is I'll cut along this line with the grinder and leave it there for the time being. We'll zip off all the way around her later on, but just to show you the amount of waste that's produced. Okay, so I'm here defended up and I've got the glasses on. I won't move the camera because it'll ruin the continuity of the video, but there's the shield. I'm just gonna pop that over the top and make sure um, we've got that on there. There is a, a guide, uh, I think I've got it over here, actually. There is this guide that you can use on these grinders to contain the dust and sparks even more than normal. You can attach a hoover onto it as well, which is what I find is it's more difficult to follow the line. There is a, 
a centre marking on this edge, but it never actually follows that line. Um, yeah, I've, I've given up on that when you're working with containment and following it, it, it just doesn't quite cut the mustard. So I use the basic guard that comes with the tool, um, and then yeah, it's just a case of following along that line. So you get the, get the grinder moving. I may pop um, some music over this because it is very noisy. Now that's actually given a really neat line. You see it's really neat and straight and I've cut on the side of the waist so I'm trying to leave the last little edge of that line on the material itself. If you're going to use this to cut out these sections that's really important because when you come to form your 90 if you cut too much away you'll end up with gaps in the trunking which is one of the reasons Oh, lift the face shield up. One of the reasons they don't like using these, sorry, they don't like you to form your own bends so much on site anymore because they know if you use the pre-manufactured bends, you're more likely to get um, the guaranteed result that they prefer. Now, um, with this, I'm now going to use the jigsaw because I don't have to turn the material around for that. So depending on which way you've got your trunking and which way you're cutting um, your flat bend, you can leave one side in of these or the other. This is the way you're taught in, in college. So I'm going to try and use that method. I would normally fabricate this in a way I've shown on another video, which would be to cut a V shape out and simply bend it together to form the 90 and then use the off cuts, the pieces that come out as you're making that 90 to then um, reinforce it and um, form the bend. It gives a nicer finish inside, I think. Um, however, this is the method that's taught in college. So I'm going to demonstrate that one on this, this video. And again, Gary's video does it really, really well. Um, so if you want to go and watch a lecture or show you how to do this step by step, go and check that one out. But in the, what we're, the method we're going to use here is we're going to cut along this line here. We need to just stop at the edge there. This center line needs to cut along here and down the back face of the trunking. Important to leave the bottom lips bit intact. So when we come to fold it, that's the bit that's going to hold the shape together. And then this line here again needs to remain intact. We're going to actually cut along here to form a little lip that we're going to keep on the trunking. We're going to have to file the back edges off and take the front lips away um, on that piece. And also we'll have to file this back edge just to snap that off. I'll show you that in a sec. But I'm going to cut these lines now. I'll do the jigsaw one um, along this centre line and then I'll use the hacksaw just to do this one here. So again, really important with your PPE with the jigsaw. You don't necessarily need to use the face shield on this one, I don't think. Glasses should just be fine. Um, because I've got the face shield on my head, I'm going to pop it back down because it's nice and simple to do, why not? But I don't think you necessarily need to do that. And um, again with this one, set the speed nice and fast, um, but keep a firm pressure on the jigsaw and watch the line. Again, this is your centre line, so we're going to run through the middle of that marker pen line, it is quite a wide line, um, and just follow it through. You can get uh, tracks that go on these jigsaw, there's a base plate, and then a track so similar to a plunge saw, so if you've got some big trunking that you're working with, and you want to be cutting all around it with your jigsaw, they're brilliant. On this smaller trunking, it's really not practical, you end up with that wiggling around all over the place, so it is a bye-eye job, or you could um, use a chop saw on this if you were careful and more experienced but I'm not going to demonstrate that because it's something that more experienced electricians might do out on site rather than learners. So we'll get this one cut now. Just pop the face shield down, hold the jigsaw up to the material and make sure we're roughly on that centre line. Spin it up off the material, don't have it touching when you start the tool or you will end up with it flying all over. So you can see there with the, the jigsaw, you've just seen me zip round. This is the back edge now, and that's the bit we need to leave intact. You can see the difference in the size of the, the, light, the waste material. There's much less cut out there than you'll find from the grinder. Um, so I'm now going to use the hacksaw to just demonstrate. In fact, while we've got it this way, I may as well just use it there. <laughs> and then I'm going to use the jigsaw for the rest of the cuts. Just Okay, so with the hacksaw, your, your PPEs, the gloves, glasses, and ear defenders, it is still noisy, so make sure you get those on. With this, in a vice, it's much easier. This is gonna be a bit whappy because I'm quite away from the um, clamps, but it is easier to, 
to cut it over the edge of the table rather than nearer to the clamp itself. And again with this one, we're trying to leave the edge of the line, if you remember with the angle grinder. Now I'll stop there and you can see the line, the material that's been removed is the smallest so far. So now that's coming across on camera, so you're taking less material away. It's easier in the way that you're not likely to make a mistake because it's all under your control. It's moving by hand, you're cutting very slowly. So when you're first starting out trying to form these bends, it is really simple to just use a hacksaw, even if it is a bit more labor intensive. So I'm just gonna cut down the back of this one now while I've got it here. So you can see now the material's free of itself. We've got this um, center line cut down the back and off the front. Um, we've got our mark in here to cut this line and then we're gonna break this lip out. So we'll run along that now with the jigsaw. Okay, so that's cut that line down there with the jigsaw. So we're now going to use our file. And with this, you need to file away on this back edge just to weaken the material so it'll then snap away. And then we're going to re retain this edge here and we need to cut along this line. I'll show you that in a sec as well. <laughs> It simply snaps off to leave a nice straight edge on the back of the, um, the bend. So we obviously file and debare all these edges as we move along. But for the time being, um, we now need to make a cut. Just unclamp this and get the blocks out. Make a cut along this edge here. Now again, you can file the back of it if you want. We're gonna need to keep this part here. Um, and we also need to take the front lip off the edge there. I just use a jigsaw. Um, it clamps it nice and tight and then you can just zoom along with that. But there are uh, other methods. Again, if you were doing this by hand, um, you would probably half, I think, maybe even cut it into thirds because getting that big lip off all at once will be quite tricky. So you're gonna, you'd file this edge. It's just the front lip of the trunk in. Just spin it around and show you. So you would file this edge here up to the line, cut that there, and then break that away. Obviously, once you've got a, a jigsaw you can use, it's much easier to just zoom along it with that, I find, anyway. So that's what I'm gonna do um, right now. So we do need to just take out this little section here. You can just mark a 10 mil gap if you want and remove the material just so you can um, join the trunk in. If you leave that intact, it won't bend very easily. It is also possible to just mark 45 mil using your, your square each way. Sorry, a 45 degree angle. And then if you measure that gap, you'll see you're moving more uh, material from the front edge, but leaving more in the back. So when you come to form that bend, it'll meet much nicer. I think it gives a better finish. 
So that's what I tend to do. And again, you can use a jigsaw for that or an angle grinder. Uh, we may as well demo the grinder again, I guess. You can see now that's now cut that V out and that'll help us form our bend. We now need to go off and file all the edges and debare things. Um, we do need to also just make sure that any of these corners on this little flap here are going to be um, nice and smooth so when the cables have been pulled around your containment later on that there's no sharp corners. So we're just going to file all of those away while we've got the opportunity. Okay, so we're now kind of in position to form our bend now and see if all our hard work's paid off. Um, this needs bending back flat because it's going to come inside this other piece here. So if we free this from the vise, I'll just drop all the deburred ends out. Okay, so we're going to want to try and form this bend now. Now the back edge is on the bottom, so I would pop that to the bottom. And then we're going to fold this over and inside, first and foremost. And it should meet nice and close to the material which it has done, I'll hold that there. You can see we've got a nice corner where we've cut out a groove at the bottom. So you can see that. And then this lip, we're gonna simply push up. You need to get this quite tight if you can. In fact, pop it in the clamps and bend that up and over. So I'm pretty happy with that. I've not joined it together or riveted it as yet, but you can see we've got a nice internal corner there where the the, the material's meeting pretty well anyway, but we've got the nice swoop from the lip inside on this back edge. Where I said we've cut the V-shaped out, that's met beautifully, so we've got a really nice corner on there. And these back pieces have overlapped lovely. They're nice and square, there's no sharp edges. So we can now mark, drill through and rivet it, which we're gonna do right now. Okay, so with your high speed drill bits, you can use your set square again to mark this out. Should you wish, you want to make sure you get a good bit of the material. If we hold it on the edge there, and we'll come in 25mm and 50mm. And that's where we're going to pop our two holes for the rivets on this bottom edge. And that'll then clamp this into position before we pop some through on the back as well. So first up, Okay, so you just see me drop, drill those two top holes out. You then need to hold the material up to where you're gonna have it in place. Make a mark on the internal material as well. And then we're gonna fold it out flat again. And just release our clamps just enough. Pop the lip down and it's just enough so you can get the drill marks on. Okay, so you will have seen me very quickly just drill those holes um, through the inner and outer material and now I've got I've popped one rivet in just to roughly hold it in position these are bent up nice and tight and we now need to pop the rivet in for this side so again make sure you're going through both skins of the material that you pull your bend up nice and tight and then simply hold the trigger and that should have given us a nice rivet on the inside Now we can repeat that 
for this other rivet that we pre-inserted already. Again, make sure you've got it in on the inside. You keep the material nice and square. Pop your visor back down just in case and squeeze the trigger. So I'll pop that out. Lift the visor back up. Pop that out and show you on the inside. So you should see this is easier to just drill straight through because the two bits of material are pushed tight to each other. Right, you can use a centre punch to get these going, but I find with these HSS, HSS bits I have, they cut in really quick anyway at this diameter. So there's no real um, desperate need to, but you can do that if you want. So again, face shield down, make sure you've got your PPE on. We're going to go in there, hold the trigger. It's giving us a nice riveted finish. You see we've got the change um, spilled out the front there, but it does actually collect the bits in the back when you're holding it upright. So I'll pop the face shield up. And that's our corner formed. You can see internal to the the trunk in you do still have the internal parts of the um the rivets but they're much smoother i think than a, a nut and bolt i mean if you was doing this with nuts and bolts obviously you'd have the um nuts out usually um so you wouldn't have them inside the containment but sometimes there's no way of avoiding it um having the nuts internal and that's sometimes because of fitting distribution boards and such on the top elevation of the, the trunk in itself you know there's no space for those nuts so you're still going to end up with that but these are nice smooth finishes it is important just to go around with the the file again or a sharp implement just to remove any of that excess material okay so there you have it you can see we've got that nice clean corner there with the rivets nice and square we've got a nice internal 90 flat 90 and we're ready to go and put this on the wall behind me. I'll show you where I'm mounting it, just so you can see the purpose of the exercise. But they're all nice and smooth inside. There's no sharp edges. It's really square. So if I pop my square up against it, you can see that's along the edge there. Hook it over. And that's now right on that. So I know we're bang on square um, and we're ready to go. Now on my other video, I've showed in the, the front covering for all of this. I'm not going to do that right now because when I finish with the containment, some of the lid is going to overlap the um, the base and that'll make sense as this moves on. So I'm not going to cut the lid right at this second, but if you want to watch some lid bin cut, I'll link to the video in the description of this. I'll get this on the wall now and you can um, see what the intended result was. Okay, so you can see there, I've loosely popped this up on top of the board. It's doing its job absolutely perfectly for its intended purpose. Like I say, this is reuse and recycle at its finest. We are on limited funds in the Apprentice One to One Academy. Um, there's lots of other plans going into this booth. This is kind of inspired by Jamie Blurt and from the podcast chats we've had around engineering and instrumentation beyond basic electrical work. This booth is all about that. You'll see we've got the scope set up here on Matthew's Jerry Rigged shelf. We're gonna have a power quality analysis meter in here. We're gonna have variable frequency drives. We're gonna have different start controllers, a control panel as well, hopefully. I'm gonna to speak to Eddie Clemens about that and see if we can get his expertise to help build something like that up. This is the first step. We're gonna have a little contact to board up here is how I've drafted this out on a plan. There's gonna be SPDs going in. We're gonna have a main electrical intake. Um, there's gonna be a quad piece of trunking going off here. We've got bits running off in every direction. We're going to really try and lay this out there, add some steel conduit in as well, um, build this up into a, a real world of environment as we possibly can with as much gear crammed into one little space that you can work on and get some experience with. We'll demonstrate it on videos and hopefully it's helpful to you guys and girls following the channel. In some of the other booths, we're going to have a domestic setup, hopefully with an EV charge point, some prosumerism, so solar battery tech, hopefully, some smart controls. We're going to have another booth for industrial kind of applications as well um, there is an intention to really build this out into something that's useful and that you're maybe not going to find in a typical training center to support that we're not here to replace traditional trainers we're here to support them and support people on their learning journeys so um, hopefully that's the way this is going to come across and you are going to get some benefit of it 
If you want to see step by step how to do this properly, go and check out Gazzy's videos I've said already over on GSH. He follows it to the book and lays it out in great detail. You will never, ever, ever go wrong by following content that's released by Gary Hayes in terms of passing your exams. I've tried to demonstrate this in as a real world environment as I can. So out on site when you maybe haven't got access to a workbench and a vice and you're trying to work with the pop-up table and the clamps that come with it and secure things in a reasonable manner to work safely and using some modern power tools um, to help you produce them in a timely manner. Like I said at the start, you're unlikely to ever have to form these bends now because most people stipulate pre-manufactured fittings. However, we had an issue of uh, COVID of not being able to get a certain size and we had to manufacture some of our own bends and it's great to have that knowledge out there for other people to be able to do the same. That's the intent of this video. So if you ever are stood there wondering how to form a flat 90, you can maybe follow my musings and hopefully it's helpful. Um, I prefer to use that Milwaukee cutoff tool like I say, you have got the permit to work issue. It is um, a fast moving uh, piece of equipment. So if you do make a mistake, you easily write off a whole length of uh, trunking. So you do have to be careful. I would say start with the hand tools, start with a hacksaw and the files, get your shape forms, get used to um, making accurate cuts and having your bends and fittings come out exactly as you want them. And then maybe introduce some power tools to speed up the production of those. The jigsaw works great. As I've said, there's no real arcs or sparks from that. The only thing you really need to be careful with is securing it tightly in a clamp. They do vibrate a lot, obviously, and produce a lot of noise. So make sure you factor that in. Um, we all have our own methods and ways of doing this. This is just mine. Obviously, I've not demonstrated the chop saw. If you're cutting off straight ends or um, you want to get an angle cut into some trunking, you can't go wrong with a chop saw with a metal cutting blade. They are really good. I'll demonstrate that on some other trunking as we move along as well, just to really give a varied idea of the stuff that's out there. If you are an experienced electrician watching this, do get involved in the comments. Let me know your methods. It's not about proving you're better or worse than me. It's just sharing that knowledge with other people who might be following so they can think, oh, maybe that is a good idea. We can try it. We can talk about it in another video. If you do have any um, ideas for things that can go into these booths or you're a manufacturer or watching who wants some of your equipment popping into here, do get in touch. Um, don't be shy with your ideas. This is to help and support industry. You know, I'm rigging this up out of my brain and there may be far better ways of doing this. So please do get involved. Shout out for the riveting tool. I use that on loads of stuff outside of electrical work. It's absolutely brilliant. It saves the manual labor of doing rivets. Um, you see here, it's given a really good result as well. We've got that 90 nice and secure. There's no sharp edges, all of the waste is collected. You don't have to wear your muscles out. What's not to like? Um, I hope you found that interesting. I realize it's something quite simple. The flat T, I've tried to emphasize the PPE. I've tried to emphasize a site environment on my video. And um, like I say, go and check Gaz out if you're on a studying journey and you've got a producer 90 to the book. That's the video you need to watch, not this one. Otherwise, I will see you on the next one. Thanks for bearing with me through this. I really appreciate the support. This is stage one in the booths. I'm excited to expand this out further in the coming weeks and I'll share bits and pieces of this on the channel as we move along. Probably not the whole build up of them all because it would take me forever to do recording and editing stuff alongside actually getting on and putting these things in place. But we will drop in from time to time. Until then, I will see you on the next one.